Hi, Thomas. Um, good afternoon to you. Um, and thank you so much for joining me in this conversation about Gerhard Richter um, and the exhibition that is currently on view at the Met Breuer in New York. Um, and I wanted to um, kick off with a um, very simple question, which I'm sure is a complicated answer. What was it about Gerhard Richter's work and his reputation at the Dusseldorf Academy that made you want to study with him? Um, and you were enrolled in his painting class, I believe, in um, 1974. Yeah, he was a very, very accomplished artist whose work I'd seen at the Museum Ludwig in Cologne. Uh, so I knew that it would be somebody who was established, you know, who was established or kind of you know, approved by the public in a way and by the museum world. And he, he also worked with you know, photography and with painting, you know, the two mediums that I was about to to uh, um, to link or you know, to wonder which with which of the the two I would stay over the time. And and also he seemed to be like the biggest challenge I could. Um, he, he exposed myself to, and I thought that's always a good thing to do. You also had mentioned earlier um, that you had been a, um, when you were a student um, with Richter, you were asked by him to paste photographs and other sort of source snapshots and that kind of thing into his um, atlas, his so called atlas, which is this, this sort of scrapbook of images that he kept. And as a young painter, not unlike Richter himself, as you just mentioned, you're taking photographs yourself. And yet you also, when you came to Dusseldorf, um, you had mentioned um, previously that some of the paintings that Richter was making then were things like color charts um, and abstract paintings. And so what's interesting to me is, you know, there you were as a young student, you were in the throes of negotiating your own interest um, in the relationship between photography and painting at that time. So what was impactful for you in observing Richter at that time in Dusseldorf? I mean, or do you think it was impactful on you? Richter was a, uh, uh, he seemed like a much more uh, uh, you're conscious and self-critical and, and uh, um, conceptual strategist in a way, which I found um, refreshing as much as I found uh, in that age the principally uh, conceptual and minimal uh, art um, very attractive because it was so um, uh, it seemed to be uh, 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 unemotional. You're not so much depending on 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 your personal expressionist uh, uh, impulses, and I found that very attractive. Mm. I can understand that, and you, you know, we begin the exhibition ourselves with um, in the Richter exhibition with um, some of his early works based on photographs from the 1960s. And yeah. they, you know, they include images like, for instance, Tish, um, an image from a newspaper, um, as well as images from family albums. Um, and, you know, you, you talked about Richter's very um, sort of incisive take, his critical take on almost with a kind of an ironic interest in capitalist um, West Germany the, the, and and. In, in some senses, kind of banality as well. Um, and at the same time, for instance, in his work, um, such as Uncle Rudy, um, his own reckoning at a very personal level um, with the traumas and the legacies of German fascism. And so I, I have two questions, I guess, related to those particular works. First of all, you, you, you once commented that you didn't feel um, or see the justification for photorealist painting in the 1970s. And so given this, do you feel that Richter's formulation of this kind of image and its incredibly re uh, complicated relationship to the idea of reality um, had any impact 
on your thinking about photography at that time. So we've moved a little bit further along in time now. There you are concentrating on photography, but there is this very vexed, complex relationship that Richter has with the idea of so-called reality. How do you feel about that at that time? I think it certainly has had, might have had a, a particular role that photography uh, uh, as a medium had been so discredited uh, by propaganda historically for Germans. And then, yeah, so, so more or less there's a, a, a very strong skepticism of, you know, about photography in Germany, you know, which I experienced myself in my career, you know, uh, in comparison, for example, with Americans who, you know, who love photography uh, and have a different, um, for different reasons. But uh, so I think that that must have played a role uh, in a way, uh, at the time when I saw these paintings, I didn't make any. I didn't know who Uncle who Uncle Rudy was, or yeah, I didn't know that some of some of the family portraits uh, were related to to Gerhard's uh, family history because at the time that wasn't disclosed. For somebody like me who who was very influenced by uh, yeah, but my own father's uh, soldier. Uh, album from from when he was you know like a, a soldier and uh, in Hitler's uh, army it was something rather normal it's, uh, it, it did not I did not uh, identify it as something uh, uh, being used in terms of the question of the, f the functionality of the medium uh, of painting uh, of photography. And then I believe that the change from, you know, for escaping from, you know, leaving his family, his mother behind, his sister and moving to West Germany, that's a very strong uh, emotional uh, um, a situation. And uh, somehow, uh, uh, I would say that the narrative or the, you, you, to reach out to, to a narrative that's both connected with your own, with, with your own actions or your own personal experiences, but also wanting it not to be literally personal. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, putting a curtain between what's really going on and transforming it into a kind of artistic program. I found that maybe the, the, the center of the impression was, you know, that, that with Gerhard, there's always a kind of layer between himself and his motivations and what is on the you know what to see in the painting and you as a as a viewer you're kind of uh, um you know you're fascinated by the beauty and by the achievement commitment all this kind of very strong longing that's in in these works but but on the other hand it's difficult to get through the to point through the um, dispassion in yeah, to some extent through the uh, protection that's going on and in that respect when I when I saw the you know, with the later uh, abstract paintings once he started to you know, to uh, to allow uh, happenstance your know, zufall as well, you know that he talks a lot about then it begins to be like a mixture you know, uh, of a uh, uh, very good interplay uh, of conscious action and strategy and and the unconscious you know like standing in front of you know what he painted let's say for the past two days and just always thinking is that what i want and that's something you cannot really uh, explain yes it's just a very emotional uh, you know, it has to do with is this the truth yeah, that I want of this very moment? So it's, it, it incorporates a lot of emotional components you know, that you cannot decipher. Kind of, I always feel this is uh, his world, but it's also the world we live in. We have in the exhibition 
these four great paintings, which are abstract paintings. And at, at the same time, we also show the origins of those paintings, which are black and white photographs taken in just a few minutes by a member of the Sonderkommando in Auschwitz as witness. They literally were designed as witnesses to um, the atrocities there. I think it's it's good that uh, you know, the, uh, the source material, you know, you know, these photographs are shown. And as a matter of fact, I, I uh, uh, even having not seen the paintings in the flesh, you know, in, in, in reality, when I opened the uh, centerfold here in the, in the catalog and where you can see the four paintings next to each other, it's a very emotionally very strong effect because they, you know, it, it, what I immediately first thought it's because that's what the cars are like. And then there's a little bit of red, which you, you cannot help yourself to think of blood and the, the green is... A yeah, little bit of a forest or some nature which is uh, you're not indestructible, but a hint of solace or something like that, maybe. Uh, and so it, they're very, um, yeah, very humble, but that's only from the catalog. I don't uh, know how I would feel like when I see them, but. Um, uh, early on, I was very doubtful that you could do that, and that it's strange to make these, you know, transfer these these photographs with with coal stick or with with pencil on canvas, and then, yeah. uh, but then uh, ultimately overpaint them. And I would follow Benjamin's uh, uh, Benjamin Buffalo, the yeah, my ben, curator for the show. Yeah, Benjamin's. Um, he texts in that respect, you know, that once he did that, he realized it's also a misuse if you do this, if you use those photographs, it's, you know, you, you run into major uh, problems. But showing them in the exhibition, I guess, it's a little bit like the Atlas. You show this, you, you had, and, and Richter has always done that, showing the, the source material and, and um, the larger field, <laughs> And circles of how he came to the, the final work by, you know, that's his, he did that already since the early 70s, I believe. So it, uh, it only makes sense to do that here as well. I, I, I wanted to sort of change the focus of our conversation slightly and sort of move to family portraits. And you've described the family as a core element of our social structure. Um, and your, there's, in your own portraits, there's a real precision, singularity. There's also an immediacy, which you've described as um, a screenshot or still life of an epic story. And the Met, of course, owns your really iconic Eleanor and Giles Robertson in Edinburgh, which you made in 1987. And while they appear to be family portraits that are taken um, quite dispassionately, they are ex at the same time incredibly revealing, um, psychologically, uh, sociologically, generationally, um, and even in some respects politically too. And I just wanted to ask you, um, because you have also done a portrait of the Richter family, in fact, two portraits of the Richter family. And I, I was wondering if you could just share with me how, first of all, they came to be made. And why you made a second image? Um, Gerd had uh, uh, you know, this exhibition at MoMA in New York in, I think, 2001. And he, uh, he, he, I don't know whether he called me or the New York Times, uh, contacted me because they were going to make a big article in the magazine uh, about his exhibition. and. They told me that Gerd had, uh, said that I should make the pictures and he wanted a family portrait to be made that would, was going to be uh, part of the article. Uh, that was very surprising, um, mostly because I was, I was wondering and I never really, I think we never really talked about that, why he wanted uh, a photograph of his family to be to be uh, in the magazine, as we're speaking about it now, I think that it was maybe related to to the the inclusion of of some of his earlier his own family portraits in his very early paintings, which I never thought about. 
uh, before actually. And then, yeah, I we felt honored and I thought, yeah, I'll, uh, 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 I'll do it. So we spent some time together in the format of the uh, your portrait, you know, it was to be a double page in a magazine. So somehow I thought this is interesting. So to, like somebody has to be on the left and somebody has to be on the right. So I was, I was trying to find, a, develop a composition idea where that would happen. And since one of the standard rules I always apply in, in, in okay. group portraits, that I, I make the frame and then I invite people to you take a position as they like because I believe in the in the truthfulness of the moment that I believe I can see well what is happening and when it's a, somehow it re, re, reveals a story or tells an interesting story and when not. So when we made this one, this was the first one that's more widely known. Yeah, the, Family portrait one, and then I asked them to find another position. Yes, you just switch around as you like. So, and then you get moving forward, and the whole situation uh, changed. And I decided that I find them both interesting. But your approach to portraiture, of course, is very different from that of Richter's. And it, you know, how do you understand it when he paints his daughter Betty, for instance, in the wonderful? picture that we have in the show of Betty's face sort of lying horizontal and or for instance the his second wife is against skin in what is called the IG um, series which is a series of three paintings um, actually comes from a larger series than that but they're, they're, it's set across multiple canvases and where their origins as photographs are probably more evident in those portraits than perhaps in some of the others. And, you know, how do you understand or do you understand that the notion of biography particularly is intrinsic to this, to, to Richter's purpose in actually painting them? I think that because he's also the, photo the photographer here in this, so, so and I, I feel, I, I think, uh, the interesting thing that I came up, sort of came across thinking about this now was, uh, yeah, of course, photography, the camera uh, uh, is a sort of seismographic tool. You know, so if you, you see it's a technical tool, uh, but of course, the eye of the author, uh, you wonder about, and then you, you pushes the button, and then you uh, capture an image. So it's, it's partly conscious, partly unconscious, because you're not you're always so extremely aware of the composition of your reasons why you make that chart right now. So, and you're then painting from the photographs or painting these photographs. You then it's not a photograph anymore. So you you liberate this. Uh, element or this uh, locked up uh, undeniable uh, construct f from its from its prison in a way and and by by repainting it it gets its own physical freedom it's it's yeah uh, it's it's an object it's also it's still referential to the the person you see but it, it's it's its own it's its own entity and certainly, for example, the portraits of Isa uh, Genskin, he, 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 he brings to my mind that she was very interested in punk music and dancing and, you know, and, and, yeah, and being, uh, and also I think these, these photographs come from a time maybe you know, not long before they got separated. So you yeah, know, so it's uh, Evan Dilly and it's it's her back. You could interpret all kinds of uh, um, uh, reasons, and you, you, you could maybe think even that because the, through the process of, of painting them, Gerd yeah, was uh, uh, you able to share a very personal 
things with the public that were not received very personal by the public, you know, which is an idea I never had before, but it's, it's you know, the, somehow saying, you know, I'm a human being. You know, I live my life, I, I fall in love, I have my your beautiful daughter you to share with the public. Yeah. Things like that. I'm not convinced you, you, that it's always about uh, the deconstruction of the of the, the quality of the medium uh, and so forth. You, that's part of the story, but it's not. You know, it's it's very evident that it's not. You know, you know, that's only part of it. A light motif in the exhibition is also Richter's use of mirrors and his glass works. Yeah. Perhaps an area of his practice that is less known, actually. Um, and as you um, know, we placed um, a work like The House of Cards in front of Marcel Breuer's iconic window. This is a trapezoid window at the Breuer building, which with which it sets up a, a dialogue. And um, I might say, I don't think I mentioned this to you before, but, you know, Gerhard was very sceptical about the Breuer building at the beginning as a site for his work. And then after some time, um, he eventually came to agree with what you have said and many others have said too, is that as an architectural space, it is actually incredibly, ideally um, suited as an environment for this exhibition and for his work. But I was wondering why you think that this particular um, space um, the materials of the space, the scale and, and light of the space is such an apt context for Richter's work in particular when there are so many other spaces yeah. in what has been seen. Well, uh, uh, think about the uh, alternative if the show would have been the, in the Mets main building. But I think that maybe in the Tisch galleries it would have looked more like a, you know, like a heroic artists of the late the 20th century in a way and here at the Met Breuer I haven't even seen the show I know the building very well I know I know Rita's work quite well uh, it, 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 it still feels like contemporary art which it is and it's 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 uh, you're, uh, you're surrounded by by very strong conceptual uh awareness of the architect who designed the, of Marcel Breuer. And um, then I could see the materials, the concrete, uh, either black floor, has a cert certain resemblance of, uh, of an outdoor space, you know, the sidewalk. And the ceiling is kind of a 60s airport. So it has all these amazing connotations. I couldn't imagine a better better cabinet for, for this show. There's a real powerful poignancy, actually. I mean... <clears throat> For all of us, I think, thinking about those works sort of in their dark and isolation <clears throat> because they exist and they, they continue to exist even without us being there to witness them. So um, I, love, I love that idea. And I must say, I've never thought about the Breuer building as having a relationship to an airport, um, <clears throat> which, makes, which changes my view of it um, somewhat, actually. I wanted to also, with regard to the House of Cards work, make an analogy between your series, your series of audience pictures, such as Audience Number no. Five, um, which you made in two thousand and four, and Richter's Glass Works, because both represent what you could loosely describe as double views. Um, one is the artist choreograph, sort of through the glass work of a visitor in the environment, and the other of course, in your photograph is the gaze of the visitor looking at themselves amongst others, themselves looking at art. And so in some senses as well, going even beyond um, those uh, um, reiterative gazes, I guess, um, they could also be seen as self-portraits of both of you, of each of you. Um, would you agree with that or does that go too far? Well, it's interesting to hear. You know, I, I, uh, uh, House of Cards is, is yeah. Uh, House of Cards are you, know, you usually collapse, and I, I, and I, I find the glass works 
very interesting and surprising in a way. So I, ne I never really sort of um, you spend more time thinking about them. Of course, there's a reference to, to Richard Serra, you know, these, these structures that sort of are yeah, being held yeah, ominously and uh, and of course glass is much more fragile and and somewhat you know it's also dangerous if they would collapse then somebody might get hurt in relationship to this you know, to the sensitivity of of the perception of space yeah, that's one gift in a way at least for my generation in minimal conceptual art here's the artwork but what's around it and how do things work? So that was a very important uh, your set of lessons uh, in a way. And of course, when you enter in a room like this, one I think I've seen it somewhere, it feels you know, like a very sensitive matter in the middle of the room that could you, you potentially collapse at any moment. You're being like, you collapse and and get trashed, which of course, it's, it's, I assume it's not because it's protected and it's, uh, maybe glass that wouldn't break uh, as such, but uh, it's definitely it questions the surrounding functionality of the building and all the use of the other materials in the in in the space the work it's is placed in. I think it's a very powerful work. It's also, I mean, it 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 fractures. It's surroundings but it also brings together in that fracturing both nature and culture in that you can see the paintings on the wall as well the, the environment in which it is placed is always of course a gallery and so i think it, it is be very playful it can also be very playful and yeah i, I don't like the word uh, poetic very much but it's uh, yeah still it's sort of it has a very subtle a, a, a ultra sensitive narrative. I just wanted to um, finish our conversation with just going back actually to your first encounter with New York ever in, <clears throat> in December 1977 at the tender age of 23 um, and during which you made the most amazing series of very evocative photographs of the city, um, Chelsea, Tribeca, Soho, Wall Street, um, many of the sites um, of, um, at which there is no uh, a great deal of activity on the streets um, today. And it was at the same time too as my own encounter with the city. And the city has changed an enormous amount since those days um, when um, it was a, a very different civic society. What I had in mind was that um, artists in those days were squatters in old industrial buildings, just as this shot in Soho um, doesn't denote, but it certainly um, was the place where I visited artists at that time. And there was a kind of um, a, a politically creative sensibility during that time that has um, been dormant for some time and only very recently been reignited for extremely good reason. Richter's painting September in our exhibition denoted a very different time in America. And I guess what I wanted to ask you was that, you know, given that the memorialization of that event, which was signified by a photographic image which, with which we were all made immediately familiar, as soon as it happened, um, it was ubiquitous across the world. How do you understand Richter's impulse to make that particular painting, some years actually after the event itself, um, of an image that is um, um, c c connected intimately with this city? I have no idea. I yeah, I think um, what the thing I went I, I saw the exhibition. I think he exhibited that uh, particular painting for the first time at Marion Goodman in Paris. He was certainly in lineage with the Baramanov paintings because it's the only other political um, politically rela directly a related uh, 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 work as far as I hear, you know, except for, of course, the personal things, Uncle Rudy and um, his family portrait with his, uh, with his aunt, uh, with his aunt. Um, but I don't know 
uh, certainly uh, uh, 9-11 was a world-changing event. It's a, it's a totally world-changing event. And um, yeah, I don't know why he painted that. Maybe it's certainly something like I'm a citizen. Yeah, I'm a citizen of the world, and it's you know, that's something I want to. You try to do something with. Yeah, I. Um, it's a tough image, and it also um, evokes, I think, some a storm of. Um, conflicting emotions um, in this very, very modest, very small scale image. Yeah, very small, it's very small, you know, you know, it's, it's, you know, you hardly, I mean, you can see what it is, but it's not, you know, it's not, you know, an altered photograph of your know, photographic material that exists. Um, um, well, this is rather a somber uh, image to finish our conversation with. Um, but these are somber times too. But it was interesting that some things came up uh, talking to Ishina that I never thought about before, which is the reason for conversation. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. 